Tonight, sexual misconduct settlement. It was difficult to share my story, but I thought it was worth the sacrifice. Victims of harassment and assault in the armed forces win a battle. But has the military met its promise to clean up its act? Donald Trump supporters find a new rallying cry. The U.S. president says he doesn't like it and tried to stop it, but did he really? They're good at everything that they do. And Canadian anime creators react to the horror at a famous Japanese studio. We'll have the latest on the attack that killed more than 30 people. This is The National. Canada's military brass says it wants to address the problem of sexual misconduct within its ranks. Tonight, there's a nearly $1 billion step in that direction. The settlement of class action lawsuits by women and men who say they were victims and who suffered in silence and shame. The settlement applies to current and former members of the Canadian Armed Forces and civilian employees at the Department of National Defence who experienced sexual misconduct, which includes sexual harassment, sexual assault or discrimination based on sex, gender, gender identity or sexual orientation. Payouts are expected to range between $5,000 and $55,000 depending on the type of misconduct. Ottawa is already expecting tens of thousands of people to apply, setting aside $900 million for the claims. The settlement needs to be approved by the courts this fall, but tonight former members of the armed forces are claiming victory after a battle that's dragged on for years. Salima Shivji has more on their fight for redress. After years of suppressing the trauma, Larry Beatty has banjo to help him move forward. The former sailor says he was sexually assaulted by a superior officer 40 years ago when he was just 18. I kept my mouth shut and um, the whole ordeal came out in about 2009. I would go to see my psychologist or psychiatrist and sometimes it would take me three hours to come back home because I couldn't drive. I was shaking. I was crying on the side of the road. But today there's some relief, a small sense of victory <laughs> for Beatty and for other victims too. Like Amy Graham, who spent six years in the military, years she says full of taunts and harassment, even assault. Feeling really good because this has taken two and a half years to get to this point. So it was difficult to share my story, but I thought it was worth the sacrifice. That sacrifice was recognized by the federal court judge who praised both sides for working together. It wasn't always the case. Last year, government lawyers argued the armed forces did not owe it to soldiers to protect them from harassment and abuse. But that aggressive line bothered the prime minister. I've asked the attorney general to follow up uh, with the lawyers to make sure that uh, we argue things that are consistent with this government's philosophy. Today, the prime minister said the deal took some negotiation but was important to his government. We have uh, moved forward on uh, changing approaches, on responding to past wrongs, and uh, working with uh, survivors of sexual uh, uh, assault and abuse to try and uh, make sure that we end this process, that we change our mindset. A change of mindset is also part of the settlement. The military is promising to keep working to tackle sexual misconduct, though Amy Graham, for one, reserves judgment. Our settlement includes policy change, um, but we still have a long road ahead. To make sure there are fewer victims in the ranks. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Even after the payouts, the military faces the challenge of fixing that ongoing culture that gave rise to the lawsuit. Sexual misconduct continues to be a destructive problem within the Canadian Armed Forces, and we have made rather limited progress in eliminating it over the past two and a half years. In fact, last year, 900 members of the regular force reported cases of sexual assault. Women were four times more likely than men to be victims. And it's even worse in the reserves. Those numbers haven't changed much since 2016, something top military leaders admit is completely unacceptable. All right, to the U.S. now, where people on both sides of the political divide are rattled after supporters at a Donald Trump event last night took things into troubling territory. They introduced a new chant, a racist message that seems to give their president a choice to make. 
Katie Simpson explains. It was quite a chant. The president is trying to put some distance between himself and his base, denouncing supporters who chanted, send her back at his political rally last night. I was not happy with it. Uh, I disagree with it. The chant was aimed at former Somali refugee turned U.S. citizen and Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, one of four Democrats Donald Trump has been attacking since Sunday. Why didn't you stop them? Why didn't you ask them to stop saying that? Well, number one, I, I think I did. I started speaking very quickly. It, it really was a loud, I disagree with it, by the way. Trump's claim that he tried to stop the chant is not true. He gave it room to breathe, an airing that lasted 13 seconds. Omar has a history of launching vicious anti-Semitic screeds. The exchange made some Republicans cringe. Congressman Adam Kinzinger tweeted, the scene would send chills down the spines of our founding fathers. I don't like it. Senior Republicans may not have liked the rally, but some are willing to defend the president and his attacks that triggered the rant, arguing it's about politics, not race. I don't think a Somali refugee embracing Trump would not have been asked to go back. Omar says Republicans are trying to stifle dissent and scoffed at repeated questions on whether this is racism. The fact that you're still asking that question is really what's wrong. Because, because we have said this president is racist. We have condemned his racist remarks. I believe he is fascist. While she remains a target for Trump in Washington. Omar returned home to Minnesota to a completely different kind of chant. Republicans are now worried about two conflicting possibilities. One, the president changes his mind and embraces the center-back chant. Or two, he doesn't, but it sticks anyway and becomes a recurring theme at those rallies Trump loves to hold. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. It's already Friday in Japan, Ian, as you know, and people there are still trying to come to terms with Thursday's horrific arson attack in Kyoto. Rosemary, we started getting word of this late last night, and it turned out to be the nation's worst mass murder in nearly two decades. This is the skeleton of the building where it happened, a world-class Japanese animation studio, now a somber monument to unimaginable tragedy. 33 people were killed in the fire, 36 others injured, 10 critically. One man was almost immediately arrested, but as Tanya Fletcher reports, details about him and his motive remain unclear. Sirens blare as smoke billows from this yellow three-story building, home to the renowned Kyoto Animation Studio, nestled in a residential area of Japan's ancient city. Witnesses say mid-morning a man burst in, doused the office with fuel and screamed die as he set the building ablaze. The fire spread so quickly dozens died in their offices despite firefighters' efforts to save them. With the main exit blocked by flames, many employees were sent scrambling up the staircase trying to reach the roof. Many of the victims' bodies found just steps from that exit. Those who survived are triaged under this orange tent. The bodies of those who didn't carry it away under tarps. The suspect is a 41-year-old man. His arrest captured on this cell phone video. He's now recovering in the hospital from serious burns. This witness says he seemed to be in pain, but also angry as if he was resentful. She adds, I heard him say something like, you copied my work. Police say the suspect was never an employee of the animation company, but the head of the studio says they recently received death threats by email. It's unclear, though, if they were sent by the suspect. The attack was Japan's worst mass killing since 2001. That was also arson. 44 people were found dead at a gambling club in Tokyo. After this latest tragedy, fans and people in the animation industry have been expressing shock and grief on social media, as did Japan's prime minister, who called this arson attack too appalling for words. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Over the years, Kyoto Animation rose from a small studio to an award-winning company influential far beyond Japan. 
To animators in this country, the tragic loss is compounded by the quality of Kyoto's work and its commitment to the art form. With its vibrant colors and subtle touch, Kyoto Animations is praised for capturing delicate moments. Fans often say they almost feel like they're watching real life in animated form. Well, today, a couple of young artists with Canadian animation company Nelvana shared their thoughts. They're good at everything that they do. Their stories, the, the animation, obviously, the character design, because I'm a character designer, it really resonated with me and how they handle slice of life animation day to day. It's very good. Someone. I think my favorite piece, well, the one that I know got me to know their studio was k -On. Because it was like a slice of life girls club animation and it was really cool with the music and the designs and the characters are really relatable in that sense. Here's another thing. Kyoto Animation was respected for its fair work policies as much as the work itself. They're very progressive because um, they compensate their workers quite well and there's quite a few women actually in KyoAni which is not very common well, hello there. but um, Kyo <laughs> KyoAni was very different in the fact that they gave lots of benefits to their workers they treated them well here's some of the other stories we're following tonight on the national more questions are being asked about how a man who killed his roommate with a meat cleaver was able to flee the country Jibin Kong was found not criminally responsible for the 2014 attack because of a mental disorder. He'd been living at Cam H, Toronto's Centre for Addiction and Mental Health. On July 3rd, he was out on a community pass and caught an international flight. I'm, I'm disgusted with it. I, I, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. They, they say this guy's low risk and he, he chopped up his roommate with a meat cleaver? Like, what are people thinking? Kong is originally from China. The Toronto Police Service has launched two investigations, one looking into whether Kong had any assistance fleeing the country, another an internal review to find any gaps in policing. A crew member has died on the set of a Netflix show in Toronto's West End. The executive producers of the show Titans says a special effects coordinator was preparing for a shoot when a piece of equipment burst. The man was hit by a shard of metal and died on the way to hospital. Production of the show is expected to shut down for two days. Well, the makeover of Edmonton's new flagship library certainly has a lot going for it. Space for cooking classes and a recording studio, new computers, a supersized children's section. But it's the outside that really has bibliophiles buzzing and not in a good way. Rafi Bujikanyan explains. When Edmonton said its new library would be fit for the stars, it wasn't thinking about these stars. The pylon hasn't stopped, suggesting someone took a wrong turn to Gotham City. Comparing the new building to Soviet relics, some say it looks nothing like the initial designs. The city says, hang on, it isn't finished yet. I'd ask people to suspend judgment. I know um, criticism is a summer sport here in Edmonton. And the keyboard warriors were out to score. One city councillor starting a naming contest. His suggestion, Bibliotank. <laughs> Pouring salt into the wound, that other Alberta city got its own new library last fall. Everyone loves it. And big surprise, Calgarians are ready to say who's got the better building. It's uh, settled down, yeah. We do. <laughs> I cannot compare with this one. Calgary spent three times as much money, $245 million compared to Edmonton's 85. And some say Edmonton skimped. We had just come off a big raft of public spending on rec centres, the arena. So perhaps we didn't want to spend that much, but we needed to spend enough to do the job. The project did go through several design changes. We found a couple of fans, sort of. To me, it looks like a landed spaceship. Yeah, I don't know, it's okay, I like it, it's fine. I really like the shape and the overall design, but the siding is... The library and its designers say that siding is all the rage in Europe and reflects heat, allowing the building to stay cool. We had to balance the exterior aesthetics, the interior service plan, along with the fiscal restraints that we were working with. People won't get a chance to see the inside until spring. Meanwhile, it's clear the library is keeping a close eye on the controversy. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Edmonton. To each their own.
Okay, uh, a story now about the environment and a small thing Canadians can do to protect it. We're talking about how to handle light bulbs with mercury after they've burnt out. The federal government wants to keep them out of landfills and has a new plan inspired by a recycler in Nova Scotia. Kayla Hounsel takes us there. Powering up and then it's all systems go to prevent the mercury inside these light bulbs from ending up at the landfill. The bulbs are loaded in the hopper. The glass goes one way, the phosphorus powder that contains the mercury goes another. It's sucked back through these pipes, through these filters, down into the 45 gallon drums. David Hall says recycling light bulbs in a way that prevents mercury from getting into the environment is the brightest idea he's ever had. It affects health issues and uh, it contaminates uh, waterways, like for example, a four foot fluorescent bulb contains 22 milligrams of mercury, and 22 milligrams of mercury will contaminate 220,000 liters of water. Now a new national strategy seeks to avoid exactly that, the brainchild of Liberal MP Darren Fisher. It's not going to make sure that none of it happens, it's going to decrease how much does happen. The number of lamps containing mercury in Canada is decreasing, but there were still 35 million sold in 2017. Only a third of them were diverted from landfills. While we're visiting, a customer comes by. So why do you think this is important enough to go through the trouble of coming down here? Well, this is all dangerous chemicals inside these bulbs. The national strategy seeks to stop the import of most lamps containing mercury in Canada and dispose of existing lamps in an environmentally sound way. But it doesn't make light bulb recycling law. It should be a must. Uh, I mean, it's a must to recycle paint. It's a must to recycle tires. It's a must to recycle oil. Always a jurisdictional issue. So you've got your municipalities handle solid waste. You've got your provincial governments that dictate what goes in the landfill through their permit and the federal government dictates what you can do with toxic chemicals. The government intends to report on the strategy's effectiveness every five years. If everybody is wants to save the planet then this is one of the things that they could do to help. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Dartmouth. Ahead tonight, the young Canadians inspired by Neil Armstrong's small step 50 years ago. And the wildly popular app that makes you look older. But what else does it do with your face? We'll take a closer look at whether you should be concerned. Plus. An eagle, a camera, and thanks to a twist of fate, one great video. All of that ahead. If you have been on social media the last few days, you've no doubt seen celebrities like Drake, Gordon Ramsay, Mindy Kaling posting photos of their future selves using FaceApp. It's one of the top photo video apps out there these days, and the company behind it claims to have 80 million active users around the world. But of course, you may also have heard there might be a big catch. FaceApp captures personal data along with a snapshot of your face. And while it doesn't say what exactly it plans to do with that information, if you read the terms of service, part of it says, and I'll just read you a little excerpts here, you grant FaceApp a perpetual, irrevocable, worldwide, transferable, sub-licensable license to use, reproduce, modify, distribute, and display your user content in all media formats and channels without compensation to you. In other words, they own your face. Or do they? For more on this, let's bring in Takara Small, technology columnist with CBC Radio's Metro Morning here in Toronto. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, can we just start by boiling this down just in really practical terms? Mm -hmm. What is the actual risk you're taking mm -hmm. if you sign up with the app and, and you send them your photo? Right, so, so like most photo apps, um, when you use these products, you're giving them royalty-free, probably from now into perpetuity, forever, all time, the access to your photos to sell it, to use it, and manipulate it. But what are you saying, that, that, that in some future sense, uh, there's mm -hmm. going to be a billboard of, of me selling mm -hmm. furniture in... Uh, St. Petersburg? like well, it's Possibly. That's the beauty of it. Or uh, could be the scary part of it. You have no idea how that data will be used. And if you read the terms of service, it also says if the company is ever sold, your user content, which is your data, could also be sold along with it. Okay. But, I mean, how, 
how plausible of a risk is that? I mean, if I'm looking for a reason to actually be genuinely concerned mm -hmm. about the risk of using this product, I mean, are we talking identity theft? Like, is that even within the realm of possibility here? I think it is, and I don't want to be dystopian, I don't want to be scary, um, but the fact that your face now is used as an ID for a lot of applications and, and for real-world world, um, incidents it should be worrying. So for airports, many airports in the U.S. and around the world, they're using your face as a physical passport. It's what you use to check in for your flight, and the fact that a lot of devices, for instance, smartphones, use your face in order to unlock it and access personal data such as email, text messages, phones, etc., means that it's more than just giving away maybe a cute selfie of yourself. There are other like real world applications that can use it to possibly influence your data or, or your identity. Okay, but, but the thing I don't get is my face is, is in lots of places. I mean, and not just me, but, but lots of people, right? I mean, we mm -hmm. upload all sorts of things all over the place. What mm -hmm. makes the, the, the photos that I'm uploading to FaceApp so mm -hmm. unique or so special? Well, the fact that they have a trove of data, that's one thing. And the fact that it requires high resolution images. So perhaps there is photos of individuals who are online, maybe on their Facebook page and group photos, et cetera. But it may not be of the resolution that's required in oh. order to manipulate those photos. Right. So in your mind, this is fundamentally different from all of the other apps that I've used and all of the other corporate, like I'm thinking Facebook and yeah, Google, right? Yeah. They already have so much of my personal information. This is fundamentally different. So it's, it's not necessarily fundamentally different. I think it's just eye-opening because the company that actually created this application is outside of North America. And with that comes a whole treasure trove of conspiracy theories and other issues with it. Right, but that doesn't make them inherently good or bad, right? right. No more so than a company in North America being of course. inherently good or bad. Of course, where they're based does not determine whether they're gonna use that data for illicit or nefarious reasons at all. But people should be aware of the fact that this company has explicitly said that it can sell your data if the company's ever sold, and the fact that it does hold on to your, your photos once it's uploaded should be, uh, should be a concern. Okay, interesting chat, Takara. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Thanks. Okay, when we come back, you'll hear how Apollo 11 is still inspiring a new generation of Canadian space exploration. I don't think you get more inspirational than that than being able to touch another planetary body in the solar system. It's the first time that we've stepped off the planet and walked somewhere else. Would you go? Yes. The Earth rises in the lunar morning and the entire world waits as man is about to take the first step on the moon. 50 years ago this Saturday, the world watched in awe as the Apollo 11 mission successfully touched down on the moon. And in that, human beings did what so many had called impossible. They walked on something that was not the Earth, a towering achievement and an enduring symbol of what is possible. Now, all this week on The National, we're saluting that historic mission with stories on how it revolutionized science, technology, even our perception of ourselves. And now, decades after humans last walked on its surface, our eyes return to the moon. Nick Purden met some of the talented young Canadians who are driven to take us back. Okay, team, the rover has landed. Mission Control at Western University in London, Ontario. From this room, they're simulating a rover landing on the moon. Did you send that word? Okay. Most of the students here are PhD candidates in geology or planetary science. Okay, so now that it's landed, what's the first command that we want to send to the rover? The goal of the training is to practice real-time communications with a rover. And we would like to drive there, please. Cassandra Marion is in charge. Right now, the tactical science team is in a discussion over what they want to ask the rover to do next. Take a panorama. Take a panorama. And how realistic are you trying to make this? As realistic as possible. I mean, the whole objective of the mission is to design operations for real moon exploration. OK, so we're now just waiting for our panorama image to be taken. But how is it that these students even want to go to the moon? I mean, none of them were born when the Apollo mission landed 50 years ago. So should we drive up there? Cassandra tells me that doesn't matter at all. 
Apollo paved the way for the future of human exploration. I don't think you get more inspirational than that than being able to touch another planetary body in the solar system. It's the first time that we've stepped off the planet and walked somewhere else. Would you go? Yes. <laughs> of course I would like to go. <laughs> Yeah. There we go. How close to the second landing site is this? As part of the training, Sarah Simpson studies the terrain around the landing site. It could well, also be some this, sort of alteration. This one is the... She's here precisely because, to her, the Apollo missions are ancient history, the last one being in 1972. Oh, that's right. It comes yeah. up, yep, you're right. I'm more frustrated that we haven't done anything since <laughs> then. It's been so long, and we, I mean, we, ha we haven't been back since then. Um, you know, we have all these great technologies and we have the ability to go up to other places in our solar system, but we still haven't done that. And you want to change that? I would love to, yeah. Okay, we have a confirmation that we did receive the Pong command from the rover as well, so all communication is good. Spend any time in mission control here, and it strikes you how seriously the students take the training. Uh, Jen, yes. the annotated SuperCam picture has been sent. Okay. Take Jennifer Newman, whose job it is to relay commands to the rover. Okay, your traverse to the hallway has been sent. Okay. Right. What's your goal, you know, in your career? Actually, this is kind of what I would like to do sometime. If I could be involved in controlling the rover and just exploring these new worlds, um, I think that would be my dream job. So your zooms are down here, and this is your orientation. Well, space missions don't happen overnight. It takes time and planning and commitment. And it did not turn red. Should it turn red? And so it makes sense that the young people of today will be the ones to make it happen. Here in Nadim is the president of Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. I met her at the Moon exhibit at Toronto's Aga Khan Museum. We're trying to elevate the student voice for space in Canada. There's a lot of people up in government talking about what to do about space. There's a lot of companies talking about the need for space uh, and retaining that in Canada, but they're not like focusing on the next generation as much. And now we Space exploration used to be a very exclusive club, top secret projects led by governments. Take the Apollo missions. They were fueled by competition between the Americans and the Russians. Hira says that shouldn't be the future. I think we need to be open to collaborating to get anything done. There's something very comforting about knowing that it's not just you know Canadians, it's not just the Americans, it's the whole world, and we can all work on one project together. Looks like our traverse has failed to complete. Yes. Got it. Leah Sachs tells me as much as she was inspired by Apollo, she hopes the next time things are different. You had about one woman really involved in mission control originally when you landed for Apollo, compared to this entire room. There's maybe, well, there's only one man in the room at the moment. Does that matter to you? Yeah, it definitely matters to me. Um, as a woman in science, um, you know, I want to make sure that I'm going to be paid the same as my male colleagues, that I'm not going to be, you know, have my scientific opinions judged based on the fact that I'm a woman that's... I would rather, much rather be judged on the actual science. If it, if it works out there, then... For the next part of the exercise, Christy Cotta will act as the rover outside. We are going to be the rover, so we'll have handheld science instruments and taking actual measurements in the field and doing actual images. With all the technical details and the calculations. So this is our, our calm link, if you will. It's easy to forget the primal reasons we have for going to space. For me, it's more about moving us forward as a whole, as humanity, right? Um, and space exploration represents some of the best that humans have to offer. We're curious and we're, we're explorers. We have to know and we have to um, understand our place in the larger cosmos. Christy explains that going to space can help us look at our own planet in a different way. As in everything else we do, and we go to space really to learn about ourselves because ultimately that's what we're seeking. We're wondering what is our place. Okay, so our drive is complete. Yep. Earth is so precious and 
and just we need to be very aware of what's most important to us right now and if we can get any other uh, perspective to help us see the earth in a different way and help us to understand that we're all here we're all in it together and we need to protect what's here and understanding what is of immediate concern and what's important and that's our home yeah i like that all right all right, gang, I'm going to call an end to the rover test for today, but thank you very much. Fifty good. years later, these are the daughters and sons of Apollo. Where will they have taken us 50 years from now? Thanks, team. Give yourself a hand. Nick Purden, CBC News, London, Ontario. Now, if the Apollo moon landing inspires space explorers even now, imagine the moment itself. 50 years ago, televised across the world, an estimated 500 million people watched it. And the next day, CBC cameras were out, asking Canadians about their impressions. The answers, sometimes surprising. He's just a stunt, and that's it. Doesn't impress you at all, does Not it? Not very much. I think that if man keeps on going as he is, he's going to destroy himself later, the years to come. What's out there, well, it was put there for not for us to know about. Maybe there's special stuff on the moon. It's a lot of days to get there. You think you might visit the moon? Yeah, I might, but I might not. Do you want us? Yes. Do you think you will? No. Why not? Because I'm not a boy. Now those words, because I'm not a boy, pretty crushing indictment of the gender bias of the times. But the trend, of course, these days has been towards equality, even if not always at rocket speed. Valentina Tereshkova, now seven and a half hours in orbit. And Another first for the Soviet Union. When Soviet Russia put the first woman in space in 1963, it was considered a trivial propaganda exercise. The Soviet press says she has brown hair and is slim, that her favorite flowers are daisies and gladioli, that her favorite lipstick is a thing called Moscow Red. 20 years later, NASA's first female astronaut still felt pressure to prove she deserved to be up there. There are a lot of people in the world, and there are some of them at NASA who are maybe reserving judgment. Following him is payload specialist Roberta Bondar. Bonder. The first Canadian woman in space had to work towards her goal, hoping society would catch up with her. I just wanted to be there at the right time with the right skill set. And, and I was more qualified in academically than anyone else who was selected for the program. I just felt that I had the right stuff. Now, roughly a third of NASA's astronaut corps is female. But while it's clear women are equally suited for space, space isn't always suited for them. During the Apollo days, spacesuits were custom tailored for all those trailblazing men. The space shuttle era was off the rack, so to speak, with standardized sizes. And it was then determined, partially because of cost, that we should decrease the number of suits. So the extra small, small, and extra large suits were, were removed. Some of our male astronauts stated that they couldn't get into their uh, large suits, so the extra large were brought back, which made it very challenging for female astronauts who tended to wear more of the smaller, extra small suit. As space veteran Katie Coleman told us, that meant tapping into a sisterhood of orbital problem solvers. I had some really great advice um, from some of the other women astronauts who had done spacewalks before about how to adapt the suit to basically take a suit that was kind of big and make it work for me. What we have now is a clarion call that we can do better. And the opportunity to do better is coming quickly. NASA committed to putting the first woman on the moon in five years. And tomorrow night on The National, we are going to take you inside Apollo Mission Control. NASA restored it so it looks exactly like it did 50 years ago, and they did it with the help of a Canadian engineer. Here's a preview as we go to break. Neil, this is Houston, loud and clear. Break, break, buzz, this is Houston. Uh, radio check and verify TV circuit breaker in. It's an important room, but this is an important chair. What is this? This is the flight director's console. Uh, this is where uh, the person in charge of that part of mission control, uh, whoever was on shift, the whole team of people that worked here, this was the head, uh, conductor of the orchestra. The people that worked on the restoration uh, relit all the lights uh, using LEDs and recreated all the displays. And all this looks like it might be put here haphazardly, but it was all uh, painstakingly 
output from photographs of what document was there, open on what page, uh, and it's really just very moving uh, and emotional experience, I think, to be here. I'm Michelle Shepard filling in for Jamie Poisson. Tomorrow on Daily News podcast Front Burner, we talk about race, Donald Trump, and ask, when is it right for media to use the term racist? Subscribe where you get your podcasts. Here's some of the other stories we're following tonight on The National. Donald Trump says the U.S. Navy has destroyed an Iranian drone in the Strait of Hormuz. This is the latest of many provocative and hostile actions by Iran against vessels operating in international waters. Trump said a U.S. ship reacted in self-defense after the Iranian drone flew within 1,000 meters of it. Iran says it has no information about losing a drone. This is just the latest escalation in the already tense situation between Washington and Tehran. Less than a month ago, Iran downed an American drone in the same waterway. Only by taking away the freedom of Jeffrey Epstein can we restore the freedom of these victims. Lawyers for the alleged victims of Jeffrey Epstein rejoicing today after the high-profile financier was denied bail. His defense team had proposed a multi-million dollar bail package, but a New York judge rejected the request, saying the 66-year-old is an extreme flight risk. Epstein will remain behind bars as he awaits trial over the alleged sexual abuse of dozens of underage girls in the early 2000s. Few industries are as labor-intensive and expensive as farming. Scraping out even a slim profit can be a challenge. But last summer, Briar Stewart met a family near Kamloops who found a way to put nature to work for them and save money. And as we revisit that story tonight, a heads up for those of you who get a little squirmy around bugs, you're about to see a lot of them. Hey, Chub Chubs! Who's hungry? At Caspian Acres, there's a menagerie of mouths to feed. There's chickens, ducks, and guinea fowl. They roam alongside a rather proud turkey and everything else that's farmed here. Sheepies! The sheep and pigs are more than content with the tubs of fruit, veggies, and restaurant waste tossed their way. But when Aras Bali Mahagdam and his wife Anastasia hey guys. expanded their brood of birds, it hit their bottom line. Hungry. When we started raising um, ducks and chickens on the farm, we realized we quickly that um, we weren't making any money uh, selling the duck eggs and uh, chicken eggs because all the feed cost was so high. They were having to buy a protein feed that contained soy, but the cost was threatening to derail their whole dream of running a sustainable farm. Yeah, yeah, here's a fly room is. Aras, whose background is in computer science, yeah. looked for a solution, and he found one in a fly. Well, actually, in its larva. Here is a tray with a whole bunch of eggs on it. So there's hundreds of thousands of larvae in this little section. That oh, are these gonna, are all eggs. These are all eggs. So that is just over half a gram. They can be seen more clearly under a microscope. Here we have a whole bunch of flies that are turning into prepupae. Once they hatch, they become larvae and are high in protein. Perfect food for his hungry birds. So how much trial and error has there been to get to this point? Tons and tons of trial and error. I, I just been, uh, I've had them fail in about every possible way that it could fail. These larvae come from the black soldier fly, an insect that needs to be in a warm, humid environment. In his first few attempts, the flies died. Once he got the temperature right, there was another issue. The flies wouldn't mate. Some people on the internet were saying that uh, if you play some type of music, then they start mating more. Uh, I tried that, actually just wanted to see if uh, it's true, but uh, I didn't know. What, what music did you play? I played a lot of disco and like uh, a lot of like uh, dance music. <laughs> was not doing it for the flies. <laughs> no, no, okay, so they just they weren't into it. Thankfully, the flies ended up sorting that part out on their own and Aras is now a full-fledged bug farmer, albeit on a much smaller scale than what's happening in Langley, BC. So here we have our Intera Grubs product. 
So as you can see, it's just the whole larvae dried, nothing added to it. These millions of larvae are destined to be turned into feed. And Terra is one of the world's largest companies betting on the black soldier fly. I think it's the greatest thing in the world. So And Victoria Leung came on board after responding to an ad on Craigslist that asked prospective hires if they wanted to change the world. There's limited resources on this planet. There's only so much arable land we have to grow crops and food for people. There's only so much water that we can utilize. And so I think it's really important that the world is looking for more sustainable ways of growing our food. And how do the larvae help with that? Well, for one, they grow really quickly. Their life cycle from egg to when they're ready to be harvested is about three weeks. And in that time, they grow one million percent of their weight. They are voracious eaters. Just watch as the larvae tear apart this hamburger. At Antara, they're fed mountains of produce. Most of these fruit and vegetables still look great, but by the time they make it to the grocery store shelf, they'll be past their prime. So what would end up in the garbage gets trucked here instead. The larvae don't need any water and take up very little space before they're turned into feed for pets, poultry and fish. It's about 40% protein, 40% fat. And the company is hoping one day also you and I. We see that as being the holy grail. We think we're probably a few more years out of it than, uh, than we'd like, but we've certainly seen the trend for insects take off in the human food uh, market. <laughs> Back at Caspian Acres, they haven't snacked on the larvae themselves yet, but they feed them to their ducklings and all the other birds. But there's no large industrial operation here. These ones were baked uh, in the oven for a low temperature, <laughs> you know, kind of dry them out slowly. Um, and then some of them are just strained through uh, material to try to get excess moisture out of it. Um, so you just put these fun. kind of like on a cookie sheet? Exactly. Or a sheet? Just, yeah, just like you with granola. <laughs> yeah. Instead of granola, they're bugs. And they get the food to feed the bugs from the local food bank, which has a program to help cut down on food waste. So here's an example of a bin. We fill up the truck every second day, and this whole food will last about uh, one day at the farm. We'll use it up. So this is the black soldier fly frass, basically their poop. As for all the waste the larvae produce, well, that gets used too in compost. We always kind of wanted the farm to be a combination of different animals and wanted to make everything kind of work together. So when we looked at it and we sort of started reading it, it felt like missing puzzle piece. And now that they've overcome all of the challenges in raising and harvesting the larvae, they're thinking about becoming breeders so they can help others learn the basics of farming bugs. Who's hungry? Briar Stewart, CBC News, near Kamloops. That will not be a backup career for me. Next on The National, an eagle grabs an accidental selfie. And I put my GoPro closer than I normally would. And then uh, some eagles, tons of eagles started showing up. A bird's eye view and more next in our moment. So the owner of a GoPro hoped that if he put his camera just close enough, he might snag a really cool picture. And he did. But he ended up with more than that. Getting a peek from an eagle's perspective. How that happened is our moment. I usually like uh, go fishing with my brother and after we process all our fish, I like to uh, bring the, the remains down, the heads, the intestines, and you know, the undesirables, and feed it to the eagles and ravens. And I put my GoPro closer than I normally would, and then uh, some eagles, tons of eagles started showing up. Some intestines landed on the, on the camera, which made it look like it could be some edible fish for an eagle, and an eagle picked it up and flew off with it, and... Uh, I thought I lost it forever, and then six weeks later, it was uh, returned to me. Seeing the footage, though, was just completely mind-blowing. I was just, just dumbfounded that I was, you know, taking flight with an eagle. That is a weird confluence of events that, ha <laughs> that happened there. Anyway, obviously, as James said, he thought that once the eagle figured out this is not uh, fish guts, he would just drop it in the ocean, and that was the end of that.
And then strangers walk by, they see this battered GoPro on the shore, I guess, and pull out the SD card. And imagine what it must have felt like as they thought, what's the story behind this <laughs> camera? What has it seen? And they put it in their computer and see that video. Yeah, it's like finding buried treasure or a note in a bottle or something like that. But so, you know, James got lucky, I suppose, right? He got his GoPro back. I like the part of the story where he learned his lesson because apparently this morning he tried to do that again, but <laughs> he tethered the GoPro to the ground, buried it, and so they wouldn't mistake it for food. <laughs> Perfect. That's the Smart. national for <laughs> this July, what does it say, 18th? Good night. Yes, I'm gonna say yes, yes. <laughs> Good night.